All right, we want to get right into the word of the Lord here. Um, we have been on a journey on Sunday mornings. We've been looking at a series called Here Comes the Bride. And uh, I, have, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the research and um, confirming Old Testament characters representing New Testament reality the relationship between Christ and the church, the way Jesus feels about the New Testament church. It just thrills and excites me. Um, I, could, I could go on for several weeks, I know, but uh, I am going to be drawing that to a close pretty quick. But uh, on Wednesday nights, <clears throat> a lot of our attention has been toward what we're calling Why People Matter. And uh, I really felt earlier in the year that we needed to focus our attention on people, understanding people, being able to relate to people, doing a better job of connecting with people. And so I've been uh, doing these sessions on Wednesday nights just trying to help us. And uh, this is another one of those lessons. <clears throat> this is a lesson that is not particularly what you would call spiritual, but it's very practical. And it has to do with why we are all here. And the Bible says Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And uh, we are part of that mandate. And our job is to connect with people, <clears throat> make friends with people, uh, disciple people, and love people. And if I can help all of us to pursue some of that, I certainly want to do that. Um, so tonight, I want to look at a subject here. Basically, we're calling it, uh, Don't Make Mountains Out of Molehills. And you wonder, what has that got to do with people? It has a lot to do with people. Why don't you turn to your neighbor, look at your neighbor, and say... Um, um, what was it I was going to have you say? Don't sweat the small stuff. Turn to your neighbor. Don't sweat the small stuff. There's a lot of small stuff in there. <clears throat> when we're in the middle of it, it doesn't seem so small. But afterwards, it's quite insignificant compared to the things that matter. I'm looking tonight at... Uh, Song of Solomon, we don't go there often, do we? Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. I'm reading out of the NIV on the screen. It's the King James Version. It says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes. Everybody said little foxes. The little foxes that ruin the vineyards. Our vineyards that are in bloom. Uh, we want to talk about that tonight and see if we can make some headway as to what we would want uh, the Lord uh, to teach us out of this, especially when it concerns other people. Um, looking at the immediate context, if you know anything about the Song of Solomon, it is a book about love, almost like a poetic book on the subject of love, and the storyline here is you have this couple who are meeting. They care deeply about each other. They love each other, and with that statement there, they are basically saying that they refuse to let the little foxes spoil the vines. They refuse to let the little things in their relationship come between them. Now, uh, as you uh, heard just a moment ago, you can get a mental picture in your mind. You have a, a little fox who's running through a grape vineyard, and maybe he's chasing a rabbit, and he's all over the vineyard, back and forth, trying to catch that rabbit. And the problem, according to this passage, is that the vineyard is in a vulnerable season. 
And it is at that time in the spring where the blossoms have come out and, of course, are very fragile within themselves. And with this fox chasing this rabbit, moving and going and stumbling and crashing into to, to, to different uh, uh Uh, plants uh, and going up and down the rows, there are many of these blooms that are being broken off in the process. So each of those blooms, had they been left alone, would have otherwise produced a grape cluster. And so the result of this fox loosed In the vineyard, even though he's a small animal, we're talking about destruction of property, we're talking about lost revenue, is the result of having a fox in your vineyard. He's small, but he can do a lot of damage if you allow him to continue and if he is not caught. Uh, That reminds us of some things about people relationships. Usually it's the little things in life that pile up against us that cause us the most worry, anxiety, and frustration. And yet when we are settled and sane and resting and rational, most of these little foxes, most of these little things really aren't near that vexing as we thought in the crisis or at the moment. So in other words, not everything small is worth making a big deal about. What applies in obviously marital relationships between a husband and a wife, the little things that get in the way, also apply to relationships in general. People that we are disciple, discipling, people who are in friendships. You know, there's a lot of that I've learned over the years about working with people dealing with people. You have your short list. I have mine. I've learned that I don't have to always be right. I learned that a long time ago. I don't have to to be right. Another thing I learned over the years is not everyone is going to like me, no matter how hard I try. I learned that a long time ago. I've also learned to pick my fight when it comes to disagreements. Not everything is worth, you know, uh, a, a, a scramble or a scratch fight in the backyard over. I've also learned that when I am talking, I am learning nothing. I may be teaching you, I may be telling you something you might not have known, but when I am talking, I am learning nothing. It's only when I am listening that I'm always learning something, okay? So those are just things I've learned. You have your list, I have mine, and it all revolves around the business of people. Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said this, to have friends, you must be a friend. If you want to have friends, you have to be a friend. Uh, Let's talk real quickly here. This is in your notes. How many of you have your sheet tonight? You have a one-page sheet. Is there anyone here that did not get a sheet and would like one? Okay, uh, thank you, Timothy. Help us out there. Raise your hand high. We'll get you a sheet real quickly. All right. God bless you. There are 10 tips we want to talk about. We're just going to rush through these, okay? 10 tips in your notes to gain and keep a friend. This will help you. You say, well, Pastor Hires, this is elementary. It's elementary, but uh, 
<clears throat> it's one of the areas that we neglect the most in building and maintaining relationships. Ten tips to gain and keep a friend. You want to know what they are? The first one is be gentle. Excuse me. Be genuine. Be genuine. Don't Try to be somebody you are not. When you're building a relationship, you're discipling someone, you're teaching a home Bible study, you're just getting to know someone, and you can see there's a lot of compatibility, there's a lot of common ground. People need to see the real you. Be genuine. Don't be something you're not. Uh, also, in your notes, be loyal. If you want friends, you have to be a friend. Be loyal. I am going to believe my friend before I am going to believe a stranger until I'm proven wrong. Until then, I'm going to stand up for my friend. I'm going to believe my friend. I'm going to reinforce my friend unless or until I'm proven otherwise. That is the, the price of friendship. Uh, also, be honest even when it hurts. These are just common things, but they're important. Be honest even if it hurts. You know, the book Proverbs says, wounds from a friend are better than kisses from an enemy. Isn't that right? Even when your friend has to tell you something unsavory, unpalatable, something that's not going to make you feel good, but you need to hear it. We need to be honest even when it hurts. In your notes, be quick to apologize. Those are magical words. I'm sorry. I was wrong. How can I make amends? Those are magical words. And those are the phrases needed to restore a relationship that's been strained. We should be quick to apologize. Another thing is we should be ready to forgive. You know, you've heard me say it before. I picked it up from a quote. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and yet expecting the other person to die. It just doesn't work that way. You know, we have to let go. We have to learn to forgive. In your notes, don't break a confidence. In other words, you share what's been told to you in private by your friend. You are not going to get that trust back anytime soon. Another one, avoid unnecessary confrontation. Avoid, I didn't say confrontation, I said unnecessary confrontation. Avoid it. Pick your fights. <clears throat> Not everything is worth arguing and fighting over. Sometimes you have to decide that uh, either I'm going to win the relationship or I'm going to win the argument but you can't have it both ways, okay? Um, in your notes, be each other's cheerleader. You know as well as I do that out here beyond these four walls, there is very little encouragement in our world. It's dog eat dog out there. And you got people running over each other, climbing the corporate ladder. You've got people talking behind each other's back, trying to erode each other's authority and ground and position and status on the job and the neighborhood. You name it, there's very little encouragement in our day. We need to be that encouragement to our friend. Encourage them. Believe in them, okay? Um, another thing, be there to help. In the clutch, you just need to be there for your friend, just like they've been there for you when you were in need. I will tell you this, and this is true. <clears throat> your friend uh, finds themselves in a crisis. Your friend finds themselves in grief. You, your friend finds himself with great loss. Uh, sometimes we go into 
that room or that house or that meeting place with apprehension. We wonder, what can I say? How can I fix this for them? Well, actually, you can't. I will tell you this. Uh, they won't remember what you said, but they will remember that you were there. And that's what you need to keep in mind. Your friend needs you at times. Be there in the clutch. Uh, another thing, uh, you need to practice 50-50 give and take. 50-50, that works both ways. You can't have one person doing all the giving and the other person doing all the taking. I'll tell you what you've got there is uh, you've, got, uh, you've got someone who is uh, just being enabled is what you've got there. Um, <clears throat> the Romans, the ancient Romans used to call this uh, Quid pro quo. You've heard that phrase before. What does it mean? It basically means you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And uh, that's, that's the way the 50-50 proposition works in a relationship, and a friendship. You scratch their back, they scratch yours. You help them, they will help you. Make sure that you are keeping that somewhere around that 50-50 give or take. Okay? Now, um, that's just uh, good common sense for anybody trying to build and maintain relationships. I have a book in my library. <clears throat> it's called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it's thick, it's heavy. Um, it, is, uh, it is basically an encyclopedia of um, historical occurrences where Christians especially during the Dark Ages, were persecuted, many times slain, killed for their faith. What amazes me is that the phrase, don't make a mountain out of a molehill, actually comes from that book. And I didn't even know that, you know. Um, <clears throat> Almost everything else in life, when you consider this is the book about people dying, people being persecuted, people being tormented, tortured. You know, the dark ages were, were terrible for uh, Christianity in, uh, in Europe. And, you know, almost everything else that you can think of would be a mere molehill compared to the mountain a person would face when it comes to uh, being persecuted, being tortured, even being killed for your Christian faith. So, you know, that's where that phrase, uh, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Um, <clears throat> this is, I think, in your notes. You might struggle with making mountains out of molehills. If you are, there are three types of people there. I want to cover them real quick. If you struggle, you tend to make mountains out of molehills. You can be one of three different types of people. Number one, you could be OCD. You know what I mean by that? I mean the perfectionist. Everything's got to line up. Got to have all your ducks in a row. You know, what other people do, just torment you and just carry, carry you into fits. You know, uh, people don't uh, jump to your tune and they don't dance to your beat and you know best and, you know, the perfectionist, OCD. The second type of person, the competitor, the competitor. And what I mean by that, that's the person that always has to be first. That's the person that has to always be right. And the only problem with that is when you get into relationships with people, that tends to bleed through. And you tend to make mountains out of molehills. Someone disagrees with you and you've got to talk them down into the ground until they finally surrender, <laughs> you know, to your point of view. It just shouldn't happen. That way. Uh, and then there are the controlling, number three, the controlling. Those are manipulative people. They have to be in control. They have to, 
to, to do their little things that wins people's um, uh, agreement, that uh, uh, forces them to come to their side of an argument, controlling, okay? So that's how this business of don't make mountains out of molehills begins. Uh, what I want to talk about for a few minutes here, I want to talk about um, there are four or five little points I'd like to make here. One being number one in your notes, decide what is big and what is little in everyday life. It's very practical here. Decide what is big, decide what is little. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we get all huffy about, we get all upset over. We're venting, we're steaming, steam's coming out of our ears, we're blowing smoke, we're so aggravated and frustrated. And when you just stop and consider, a lot of the stuff that we get frustrated and aggravated about isn't worth it. It's too small. It's too insignificant. You know, really, when you think about it, there's only a small handful of things that are truly big in your life that are worth thinking about, worth working toward, worth defending, and that is your relationship with God, life in general, your, your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, living right. These are big things. Living right, personal disciplines, having enough discipline in your life spiritually and physically, that you're not abusing yourself, abusing your body, staying in contact with God, prayer, Bible study, <clears throat> Bible reading, fellowship. All of those are what we would consider to be personal disciplines. And then, of course, you know, your food, your shelter, your clothing, your marriage, your children, your friends. These, these are the things that are important. These are the things that matter. Most of the other stuff out there, when you compare it to these, very small, very insignificant. And uh, they're just nothing but a little fox making a lot of noise. Everything else generally in life is small potatoes when you compare it to those things. You know, uh, when you think about it, it really doesn't matter that you burnt the beans. It really doesn't matter. It's nothing to come unglued over. When you uh, drop the glass pitcher full of sweet tea in your nice, clean kitchen floor, I know it's a, a mess to clean up. I know it's a, a sticky mess to have to fix, but it's temporary. 10 or 15 minutes of cleanup, and you move on with your life. Be surprised how many people scream, holler, blow up, throw things. You know, it's huge to them. Well, is it really? Does it really matter if you spent two extra hours more than planned in painting that room? Does it really matter? You know, is it a big deal? Is it really a big deal that you've misplaced your cell phone again? You can't find it. You know, we scream, we holler, we get mad, we get upset, right? Is it really a big deal? You know, instead of flying off the handle, instead of blowing up, a lot of times if you just stop and consider, you know, this is small stuff. This is little stuff. You know, this really won't matter just a little while from now. So what if I scuff my new shoes? So what if I scratch my late model car? So what if I've done more for my spouse this month than she or he has done for me? And I know because I've been counting. Does it really matter? Is that really important? You know, relationships can suffer when one person seems to be fixated on every flaw, every discrepancy, every misstep, every behavioral quirk. 
of their spouse. You know, that happens more often than we think it does. So in your notes there, as they say, don't sweat the small stuff. All of this is little stuff here. You know, it's, it's amazing how many little things can start to grate on the nerves of a young couple after the honeymoon, and now you have to actually start learning how to share space. It's amazing. All those little things start showing up, you know? Squeezing the toothpaste from the top or the bottom, you know, is a relationship killer for some people. They get into uh, dog-eat-dogs, drag-all-out fights over how the toothpaste comes out of the tube. You know, how about keeping the toilet lid up versus keeping the toilet lid down becomes what? A battle of the wills, right, for some people. You know, is it really important whether you rinse out your cereal bowl or not after using and putting it in the sink? For some people, it's worth fighting over. It's worth having an argument. It's worth leaving the house mad. But is it really anything big? It's the little stuff that bothers us. It's the little stuff that accumulates that usually gives us the most trouble. You know, is it really a big deal that your spouse happened to get the last word and the uh, most recent argument between you? Some people think, i got to have the last word, you know. Is that really all that important, you know? Then there are some people, you know, is it really all that important that you risk life and limb exceeding the speed limit on the way to work just so that you could beat all the other cars on the highway? (laughs) You ever met people like that? My wife and I, we know people. You're driving down the highway, highway speed, 60, 65 miles an hour. One mile up the road, there's someone that is ahead of you, and uh, we both know people that have to stomp the gas and drive 80 in order to get up behind them. And, uh, and then, of course, you're just waiting and looking for the opportunity to pass them so you can, I guess, feel a little better about yourself. I don't know. That's the way some people are. You know, what about that driver who cut you off and cursed you out? You know, is is it worth getting into an argument? Is it worth road rage? Is it worth ruining your day that someone who doesn't even know you, that probably was angry before they ever saw your face, upset about something else, and they just happen to take it out on you at the moment? Those are the kinds of things that happen day in, day out. And some people get all out of whack over that, get all upset over the smallest things, you know. I think life goes a whole lot sweeter, a whole lot smoother when we realize all that stuff is just small potatoes. It really is. It's just small potatoes. And if you stop and tell yourself that in the moment, it can help you. It can help put a lid on your emotions. It can help stall your anger. It can help you from saying things that you later regret and have to apologize for. So all of that happens, you know. So uh, another thing we need to do is we need to learn to let go. We need to learn to let go. Have you ever met people, they take everything Dead serious. You ever met people like that? So what if you lose a little sleep overnight because of late night pizza? You know, some people it ruins their next day, you know, because they didn't get their full eight hours of sleep, you know? Um, what if what if you do look in the mirror and you find a new gray hair? Is that really a big deal? And there are people in the building, oh, that's a big deal to me. But is it really a big deal? 
you know? So what if the tire goes flat on the SUV again? You know, my SUV has sensors in the wheels. I had them all replaced just recently when I had all my tires changed out. And uh, so I'm thinking I'm good to go for another 60,000 miles or so before a sensor goes bad. Well, wouldn't you know it, you know, uh, less than a month after having brand new tires put on my vehicle, new sensors put on, I've got a sensor that doesn't work. I've got a tire. I don't know what the air pressure is. You know? And so one of these days, maybe when I rotate the tires out, I'll get it fixed. And until then, I just look at it, <laughs> frown. But am I going to let it ruin my day? Even though it is going to cost me $65 to replace it. I'm not going to get upset about it. That's the way we think, Right? Sometimes we just have to stop, think, breathe. She's getting my eyes checked today. She's looking in my eye and, and she said, now hold your eyelid open. Don't forget to breathe. Stop. Don't forget to breathe. And just think, hey, it'll all be fine. This day will be done. The sun will go down. <clears throat> I'll have a nice evening. The sun will come up in the morning. It is not the end of the world. What you, what you could do, and this has helped my wife and I, we actually at times, we, we laugh over this little phrase. You know, when things go wrong, we'll finally just throw our hands up and say in 100 years it won't matter anyway. And sometimes you just have to train yourself. You know, a year from now, I won't even remember this. A month from now, this won't even be worth discussing or arguing over. Learn to let go. Everybody said let go. Another thing we need to do, three in your notes, remember that everybody has to deal with unpleasant surprises in life. Everybody. You know, we got people in our life that, you know, that we think, we tend to believe that they never have a bad hair day, that they never make a, a terrible decision, that they always have plenty of money. And uh, that their equipment always lasts longer than everybody else's. And that they, uh, they have perfect teeth and perfect hair. And, you know, just you can go on and on with that. And sometimes we compare ourselves with people, especially the wrong people. And we begin to think that, you know, I don't have what they have. And the truth of the matter is everybody has unpleasant surprises in life. Can I say it? It is inevitable that everybody's going to end up with a hole in their sock. It happens. It happens to everybody. That was probably news to some of y'all, wasn't it? It happens to everybody. Everybody at one time or other has to say, wow, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I misunderstood. Um, Everybody in life has to deal at times with tooth decay or a sinus cold. I could say it. Everybody sooner or later has to deal with COVID or flu, right? We all thought that we were Superman. We were going to get past that. And, you know, I, I went my first full year, Michelle and I both, and people in the church had COVID here, there, and yonder, and God was gracious and God was merciful and we had it in our head. Wow, that, that one's not going to catch up with us. And then the second year it caught up with us in January. You know, it happens to everybody. You know, you get up in the morning, right? You go to the mirror to wipe your face, you know, and you look in the mirror and your eyes get wide as saucers. And you say, oh my God, a pimple. Everybody deals with unpleasant surprises. You know, sometimes you feel at the moment 
that, you know, this world is coming to an end. And the truth of the matter is, it's little stuff. Just little stuff. Little foxes. All it is is just a blip on your radar screen. And if you get the right framework, the right mindset, the right attitude before the day's over, you've already forgotten about the misstep earlier in the day. Everybody has to deal with this stuff. So what you need to do, turn to your neighbor and say, lighten up. Everybody deals with this stuff. Join the rest of the world who staggers along, you know, from disaster to disaster. Join the rest of us human beings, us homo sapiens, you know, that, that struggle and are absent-minded. We forget stuff. We're high-strung. We're weak-kneed. We're, we're a mess. Well, join the rest of us because that's where really everybody is at. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has a perfect life. Everybody has problems. And the truth of the matter is, you know, you wish you could have uh, other people's problems and you'd trade out the New York Minute until you sat down with them and let them give you the list as to what they're facing. And suddenly, you're glad that you don't have their problems. It really does work that way. You would not want to switch places with most people in the world. Okay? Uh, then there's number four. Forgive and forget those who oppose you. Forgive and forget those who oppose you. You remember you heard me say, as much as you try, there are always going to be some people in your life who, I don't like you. Do you know that happens to all of us? There are people in our lives, <clears throat> they don't like you. And it's not that you've hurt them. It's not that you've wronged them. They just don't like you. They don't like your looks. They don't like your dress. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like where you came from. They don't like your family dynamics. They don't like your level of education. Whatever it is, they don't like you. You know, you need to learn to forgive and forget some people. In fact, the people that irk you the most are the people you ought to be the most kind to. And what I mean by that, it's for your sake. It's for your benefit, not theirs. You know, if, if you know that a person, they can't stand you, one of the best things you can do is hunt them down and make them shake your hand with a big smile on your face. You know, it makes them miserable. It makes them feel guilty. You know, it makes them dislike you all the more. But you know what? It makes you feel a whole lot better. There are actually people like that. It's not worth it to your stomach lining. It's not worth it to your blood pressure. It's not worth it to your state of mind to let other people drive you nuts. It's little stuff. You need to learn to make a game out of it. You got people that don't like you? Well, fine, you know. Double dare yourself to not let that person get you all worked up. Get you in a feeding frenzy. Tie you up in knots. You know, make, dare yourself. I'm not going to let other people, their activities, their attitudes, hinder my peace of mind and joy. There are some people, you just got to show them some class when all they can show you is their disrespect. Okay? And that's just the way it is. Can I hear it? Can I say it? It is not your problem. It's not your problem that they don't like you. It's not your problem that they disapprove of you. You need to listen to me. Don't make it your problem. It's their problem. Okay? Oh, it's got quiet in here. You would think there are some of you here that have somebody who doesn't like you. Wow. Don't make mountains out of 
molehills. <clears throat> we had a cat whose name was Spooky. And uh, it wasn't unusual for him to, <clears throat> during his night extravaganzas, to uh, come up with mice or rats or lizards and every once in a while a, a big fat mole. And uh, they, he would lay them on the doorstep there for us. You know, don't let a mole in your yard alter your attitude and make a mountain out of your day. Because if we're not careful, we can let one or two people just ruin our whole day. You know what moles do? Moles displace dirt from the front to the back, from the front to the back. That's, that's what they do. That's what moles do. That's how they build their tunnels in your front yard, messing up all your beautiful lawn. That is what they do. They move and displace dirt from the front to the back. They dig tunnels in your yard. You know, you know it when you got a mole in your yard. There's no question about it because it's obvious. And it's also obvious to your neighbor too. They see it. But you see, that is life. You got moles in your yard because that is life. Get used to it. Adjust to it. Moles do what? They move dirt. And they do it because it's their nature, okay? Now, I said all that to say, sometimes it feels like there are people who personally get under your skin. It may be a neighbor. It may be a coworker who's in competition with you. It may be a family member. It may be someone who otherwise is driving you nuts. You know, uh, when you see them, you know, all of those familiar negative emotions swell to the surface, you know. Uh, sometimes it feels like people get under our skin, and if we let them, they can make life miserable for you. We're talking about making mountains out of molehills. But what you've got to learn to do is people cannot make you feel inferior People cannot make you angry. People cannot upset your day without your permission. You have to agree. You have to give them permission to ruin your day. So in other words, the best thing you can do, <clears throat> don't take it personal. Wow, well, Pastor Hires, it sure feels personal at times. We're talking about relationships. Don't take it personal. Remember, nobody is liked by everybody all the time. It is a statistical improbability, impossibility. You're not going to make everybody happy. So stop trying to make everybody happy. You work at the relationships for people who you see value and care and mutual concern. Don't take it personal. You're not the exception. You're going to have people that don't like you. Don't take it personal. Okay? Um, for all you know, <clears throat> you may remind that person who winds you up like a top. For all you know, just them seeing you reminds them of somebody else in their life from their past that they didn't like either. It has nothing to do with you, but it just has everything to do with associations. So you have to learn, you know, who you are going to allow access to your life as to feeding you, encouraging you, strengthening you, building you up. And those people are the people that you need to gravitate toward. Uh, if you don't mind, then it doesn't matter. 
If you don't let people get under your skin, then it won't matter, okay? So um, let's look at number five real quickly. Focus instead on easing someone else's discomfort, pain, or inconvenience. Focus instead on erasing or easing someone else's discomfort, pain, or inconvenience. When was the last time you saw a stranger? Maybe at the store or at a restaurant or in a parking lot or a waiting room, and you could tell that they were um, upset, that they were struggling, that they were having a hard time with something. My question is, did you stop to help them? There have been times that I have to honestly say I didn't stop to help them because in my mind I told myself I was too busy. But the truth of the matter is, we're in the people business, and we're in the business of helping others, especially those who are in discomfort, those who are suffering, those who are in pain, those who are being inconvenienced. Now, I get it. I understand it. You can't pick up every person on the side of the road who's looking for a ride. I get that. I understand that. But there are times we run across people that there's a feeling in our spirit that this person is a decent individual and they just are having a bad moment, have been caught unawares, uh, they're at a loss, they're dealing with a problem. We need to try to help them. Sometimes a phone call or a text or an email can go a long way in encouraging someone who's having a bad moment. You know, these things matter to people, especially when we're in trouble. Like I've said before, people won't remember the wisdom that you spouted out when you arrived. They won't remember your Bible verses. They won't remember your illustration. They won't remember your words of wisdom. They'll just remember that you were there and that you cared, okay? Helping somebody lighten their load a little bit less can literally make that person's day. They can talk about it for the rest of the day. They will revert back to it. It may be one of the few kind things that happens to them that very day, and I promise you they will remember it. Let's stand to our feet. Just adding a little more depth to a person's dignity or self-respect can go a long way in helping a person in an otherwise miserable day. Have you ever met people today? It just seems like they're so unhappy. You look at people and you can tell their countenance, their attitude, their words. They're just an unhappy person. There are usually reasons why people are unhappy. And sometimes those reasons have nothing to do with any fault of their own. And so we need to exhibit kindness and care. In fact, that's what being a Christian is all about. That's what separates us from the herd. You know, Jesus said, by this, this is John 13, 35, by this, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. You know, so it's not about me. It's not about making me happy. It's not about pleasing me. It's not about my world revolving around me. It's about him and my service to him. It's about my brother. It's about my sister. It's about serving others, blessing others, helping others. That's where true joy and happiness is found. And so we can literally make a person's day with an act of kindness, unexpected. We can take a person's a mountain of a day, the problems, and convert it to a mole of temporary inconvenience. We can also take our little small gestures that to us is nothing but a molehill, but to someone in need, someone who's desperate, someone who's at the end of their rope, it is a mountain of generosity and kindness and care. 
So what I want us to do, our time is gone. I want us to pray. I want us to pray right now for God to help us to have the true spirit of Christianity. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about every one of us. For us to be kinder and gentler and more helpful with people around us. Can we do that? God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we, we're grateful and thankful for all that you mean to us, all that you do for us. God, I want to thank you, Lord, that you're a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You're our best friend. Nobody has ever treated us like you treat us. No one has ever been as good to us as you've been to us. And tonight, oh God, we want to exemplify, we want to demonstrate, Lord, we want to portray and model Christianity. We want to be men and women of faith and integrity and kindness and generosity and, and goodness. I pray right now in the name of the Lord that you would help us to put in perspective the things in life where they really fit and belong. Help us, God, to, to stop getting out of control over the little things of life. Help us, Lord, to stop uh, uh, dwelling on the little things of life that ruin the rest of our day. But God, help us, Lord, to see what's important and what's valuable and what's big in your your side and in the kingdom side. I pray right now in the name of the Lord that you would help us to be more sensitive and kind and generous to people who are around us. Help us, Lord, to look for those God-given opportunities to show people what Christianity is all about. Help us, Lord, to be kind and good and generous. And God, we thank you for helping us, Lord, for walking with us, for bringing us into the truth. And we're thankful, Lord, that we're a part of the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, to be men and women of faith. Help us, Lord, to exemplify that brotherly love and kindness everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Appreciate you.